This is Orson Welles, speaking from London. The Black Museum, a repository of death, a repertorium of violence. Here in the grim stone structure on the Thames, which houses Scotland Yard, is a warehouse of homicide. Where everyday objects, a teacup and its saucer, a lady's parasol, a surveyor's chain, all are touched by murder. Now you take this lady's shoe. It's a familiar object, eye of heel, neat cross straps, dainty design on the toe, an excellent sample of the art of the modern bootmaker. Like my new shoe, Lovely, my dear. Shows that your things go perfectly. And the way it breaks away from the curve of your heart. Enticing. Definitely enticing, my dear. Henry, you're impossible. <laughs> and I love it. A nice couple talking about a pair of shoes. When I hear more about that couple, I hear more about the shoe. Oh, shoe, by the way, is to be found today. From the annals of the Criminal Investigation Department of the London Police, we bring you the dramatic stories of the crimes recorded by the objects in Scotland Yard's Gallery of Death, the Black Museum. Home at last. It's going to be one. Glad you bought the place. We bought it, darling. Your 
Your money is weak. Mine is good. Ours are yours. There's always a lot to do with a panel.
I'm going in to pick up this bit. We should be back a little after ten. Ten. Funny. Mrs. Hibbert wasn't at the station. She must have missed the train and decided to stay in town that night. I had a letter from Mrs. Hibbert. She's staying with relatives in London for a few days. Nothing to worry about.
these days, but Muriel. How would you like to take a trip with me, Muriel? Oh, you mean close up the house? Why not? I'm not sure I want to go away. Oh, you're a sweet man, Henry. I live here. You've no idea how we could live, what fun we could have. I can draw all the cash from the banks in 10 and 25 pound notes, so it wouldn't take too much room. And we could have a time in London, a real time. I might so Henry planned a little trip. And he took the trip. Hardly enough, we were a little while along. A permanent tie was not in her plans at the moment she stayed behind in the house. Just after she moved into the house with her husband. I'm afraid we never answered her. The family disapproved of Higley and Lee. Oh, any particular reason? Well, he was penniless. Elizabeth, as you probably know, has a nice income and quite a bit of talent. She bought the house. Yes, yes, we heard about that. That's one reason we sought you out, Mr. Marlowe. Are you intimating the possibility of trouble? There's always the possibility when a grown person disappears without a trace. And there have been rumors, a few odd coincidences. In any case, we checked the bank. The manager showed us these papers. Well, what are they? A deed transfer giving full title to the house and property to Henry Higley. Is this your sister's signature, Mr. Oh, let me see. I, I need my glasses, I'm afraid. Now yeah. then... Looks like hers. say with reasonable certainty that this is not my sister's signature. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. To all stations, alert for one Henry Higley, wanted for forgery. Notify all banks. The following serial numbers are of 25 pound notes connected with forgery cases. Appearance of any of these notes to be called to the attention of the local police at once in the usual manner. At long last, the hunt was on. The charge pending. Forgery. The day passed, nothing was reported. An occasional bank was the serial number of the Patient in places where the notes of the end was charted. And yet, then note. A week later, folks are. I imagine we'll find he spent a few days in Paris. After that, Kingston. I expect we'll be hearing from London itself, Doctor. How long does it take to change a mere 25 pounds? One would think the Bank of England had that much cash in small denominations like that. I beg pardon, sir. Are you the gentleman wanted to change this note? I am. Now, would you mind stepping this way for a moment, sir? I'm rather in a hurry. Something better. With the note, no. And my credentials, sir. I see. Detective Inspector Andrews. And you, sir? Higley. Henry Higley. Why all the mystery, Inspector? I'm afraid I shall have to ask you to come to me, sir. You see, the serial number of this banknote and several others have been published in a small matter of forgery. Forgery? What's that to do with me? I'm sure you had nothing to do with it, Mr. Higley, and that you will be most anxious to cooperate with the police. This way, sir, if you don't Henry did remember. His sense of cooperation became stunted. Of course I drew the money. It was a joint account. I had a right to. And what is your explanation of the transfer of the house? There's none I can give you now. When Elizabeth returns... Where is your wife, Piglin? She didn't say. Just stay with friends. Any reason for that? We, uh, well, we had a couple of lovers. She'll get over it when she comes back. You seem very certain she will come back. Have you any reason, Inspector, to doubt the children? No, not at the moment, nor any reason to doubt that you will be here awaiting them. Do you mean to say you're thinking of holding me on charges? Frankly, we are. You see, Higley, we did a little routine checking. We found that you've been arrested three times, convicted once. 
In each case, the charge was swindling women who were old enough to know better. So we are holding you, Hickley. And the charge is forgery. Now, the direction of the search changed suddenly. Henry Hickley is safe. Remain so. Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the Air in The War of the Worlds by H.G. Webb.
Ladies and gentlemen, the director of the Mercury Theater and star of these broadcasts, Orson Welles. We know now that in the early years of the 20th century, this world was being watched closely by intelligences greater than man, yet as mortal as his own. We know now that as human beings busied themselves about their various concerns, they were scrutinized and studied, perhaps almost as narrowly as a man with a microscope might scrutinize the transient creatures that swarm and multiply in a drop of water. With infinite complacency, people went to and fro over the earth about their little affairs, serene in the assurance of their dominion over this small, spinning fragment of solar driftwood which by chance or design man has inherited out of the dark mystery of time and space. Yet across an immense ethereal gulf, minds that are to our minds, and ours that are the beasts in the jungle, intellects vast, cool and unsympathetic, regarded this earth with envious eyes and slowly and surely drew their plans against us. In the 39th year of the 20th century came the great disillusionment. Near the end of October, business was better. The war scare was over. Four men were back at work. Sales were picking up. On this particular evening, October 30th, Crosley Service estimated that 32 million people were listening in on radio. Change in temperature. A slight atmospheric disturbance of undetermined origin is reported over Nova Scotia, causing a low-pressure area to move down rather rapidly over the northeastern states, bringing a forecast of rain accompanied by winds of light gale force. Maximum temperature 66, minimum 48. This weather report comes to you from the Government Weather Bureau. We take you now to the Meridian Room in the Hotel Park Plaza in downtown New York, where you will be entertained by the music of Raymond Raquello and his orchestra. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. From the Meridian Room in the Park Plaza Hotel in New York City, we bring you the music of Raymond Raquello and his orchestra. The touch of the Spanish, Raymond Raquello leads off with La Capacita. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we interrupt our program of dance music to bring you a special bulletin from the Intercontinental Radio News. At 20 minutes before 8 central time, Professor Farrell of the Mount Jennings Observatory, Chicago, Illinois, reports observing several explosions of incandescent gas occurring at regular intervals on the planet Mars. The spectroscope indicates the gas to be hydrogen and moving toward the Earth with enormous velocity. Professor Pearson of the observatory at Princeton confirms Farrell's observation and describes the phenomenon as, quote, like a jet of blue flame shot from a gun, unquote. We now return you to the music of Ramon Raquello playing for you in the Meridian Room of the Park Plaza Hotel situated in downtown New York. that never loses favor, the ever-popular Stardust, Raymond Raquello and his orchestra. Ladies and gentlemen, following on the news given in our bulletin a moment ago, the Government Meteorological Bureau has requested the large observatories of the country to keep an astronomical watch on any further disturbances occurring on the planet Mars. Due to the unusual nature of this occurrence, we have arranged an interview with a noted astronomer, Professor Pearson, who will give us his views on this event. In a few moments, we will take you to the Princeton Observatory at Princeton, New Jersey. 
We return you until then, the music of Ramon Raquello and his orchestra. now to take you to the Princeton Observatory at Princeton, where Carl Phillips, our commentator, will interview Professor Richard Pearson, famous astronomer. We take you now to Princeton, New Jersey. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Carl Phillips speaking to you from the observatory at Princeton. Standing in a large semicircular room, pitch black except for an oblong spread in the ceiling. Through this opening, I can see a sprinkling of stars that cast a kind of frosty glow over the intricate mechanism of the huge telescope. The ticking sound you hear, the vibration of the clock. Professor Pearson stands directly above me on a small platform, peering through the giant lens. I ask you to be patient, ladies and gentlemen, during any delay that may arise during our interview. Besides the ceaseless watch of the heavens, Professor Pearson may be interrupted by telephone or other communication. During this period, he is in constant touch with the astronomical centers of the world. Professor, may I begin our questions? At any time, Mr. Pearson. Professor. Would you please tell our radio audience exactly what you see as you observe the planet Mars through your telescope? Nothing unusual at the moment, Mr. Phillips. A red disk swimming in the blue sea. Transverse stripes across the disk. Quite to think now, because Mars has to be at the point nearest the Earth in opposition, as we call it. In your opinion, what do these transverse stripes signify, President? Well, not canals, I can assure you, Mr. Phillips. Although, that's a popular conjecture of those who imagine Mars to be inhabited. From a scientific viewpoint, the stripes are merely the result of atmospheric conditions peculiar to the planet. Then, you're quite convinced, as a scientist, that living intelligence as we know it does not exist on Mars? Say the chances against it are a thousand to one. And yet, how do you account for these gas eruptions occurring on the surface of the planet at regular intervals? Phillips, I cannot account for it. Well, by the way, Professor, for the benefit of our listeners, how far is Mars from the Earth? Approximately 40 million miles. <laughs> well, that seems a safe enough distance. Uh, just a moment, ladies and gentlemen. Someone has just handed Professor Pearson a message. Why the speech it? Let me remind you that we, we are speaking to you from the observatory in Princeton, New Jersey, where we are interviewing the world-famous astronomer, Professor Pearson. Uh, one moment, please. Professor Pearson has passed me a message which he has just received. Professor, may I read the message to the listening audience? Certainly. Ladies and gentlemen, I shall read you a wire addressed to Professor Pearson from Dr. Gray of the Natural History Museum, New York. Quote, 9.15 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Seismograph registered shock of almost earthquake intensity occurring within a radius of 20 miles of Princeton. Please investigate. Signed, Lloyd Gray, Chief of Astronomical Division. Unquote. Professor Pearson, does this occurrence possibly have something to do with the disturbances observed on the planet Mars? Well, uh, hardly, Mr. Phillips. Just Probably a meteorite of unusual size, and its arrival at this particular time is merely a coincidence. However, we shall conduct a search as soon as daylight permits. Thank you, Professor. Ladies and gentlemen, for the past ten minutes, we've been speaking to you from the Observatory of Princeton, bringing you a special interview with Professor Pearson, noted astronomer. This is Carl Phillips speaking. We are returning you now to our New York City. Ladies and gentlemen, here is the latest bulletin from the Intercontinental Radio News, Toronto, Canada. Professor Morris of Macmillan University reports observing a total of three explosions on the planet Mars between the hours of 7.45 p.m. and 9.20 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This confirms earlier reports received from American observatories. Now nearer home comes a special bulletin from Trenton, New Jersey. It is reported that at 8.50 p.m. a huge flaming object believed to be a meteorite, fell on a farm in the neighborhood of Grover's Mill, New Jersey, 22 miles from Trenton. The flash in the sky was visible within a radius of several hundred miles. And the noise of the impact was heard as far north as Elizabeth. We have dispatched a special mobile unit to the scene. And we'll have our commentator, Carl Phillips, give you a word picture of the scene as soon as he can reach there from Princeton. In the meantime, we take you to the Hotel Martinet in Brooklyn, where Bobby Millet and his orchestra are offering a program of dance music. Thank you. 
now to Grover's Mill, New Jersey. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Carl Phillips again, out at the Wilmot Farm, Grover's Mill, New Jersey. Mr. Pearson and myself made the 11 miles from Princeton in 10 minutes. Well, I hardly know where to begin. Paint for your word picture of a strange scene before my eyes, but nothing out of a modern Arabian night. Well, I just got here. I hadn't had a chance to look around yet. I guess that's it. Yes, I guess that's the thing directly in front of me. Half buried in a vast pit. Must have struck a terrific force. The ground is covered with splinters of tree. It must have struck on its way down. But I can see if the object itself doesn't look very much like a meteor. At least not the meteors I've seen. It looks more like a huge cylinder. Has a diameter of... Uh, uh, what would you say, Professor Pearson? What's that? Uh, what would you say, uh, what's the diameter of this? About 30 yards. About 30 yards. The metal on the sheet is, well, I've never seen anything like it. The color is sort of yellowish-white. The curious spectators now are pressing close to the object in spite of the efforts of the police to keep it back. They're uh, getting in front of my line of vision. Uh, uh, would you mind standing one side, please, while the police are pushing the crowd back? Here's Mr. Wilmot, owner of the barn here. He may have some interesting facts to that. Mr. Wilmot, uh, would you please tell the radio audience as much as you remember of this rather unusual visitor that stopped in your backyard? Uh, step closer, please. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Mr. Wilmot. I've listened to the radio. Closer and louder, please. Pardon me? Uh, louder, please, closer. I was listening to the radio and kind of drowsy. A professor fellow was talking about Mars. Well, I was half chosen. Half yes, yes, Mr. Wilmot. And uh, then what happened? Well, as I was saying, I was listening to the radio, kind of halfway. Yes, Mr. Willett, and then you saw something. Not first off, I heard something. And what did you hear? A hissing sound, like this. Uh, kind of like a 4th of July rocket. Yes, then what? I turned my head out the window and would have sworn I was asleep and dreaming. Yes. Seen a kind of greenish streak and then zingo. Something smacked the ground, knocked me clear out of my chair. Well, were you frightened, Mr. Willett? Well, I ain't not sure. I reckon I was kind of riled. Well, thank you, Mr. Wilmot. Thank you very much. Yes, you no, that's quite all right. That's plenty. Ladies and gentlemen, you've just heard Mr. Wilmot, owner of the farm, where this thing has fallen. I wish I could convey the atmosphere, the background of this fantastic scene. Hundreds of cars are parked in a field in back of it, and the police are trying to rope off the roadway leading into the farm, but it's no use. They're breaking right through. Cars' headlights throw an enormous spotlight on the pit where the objects have buried. Now, some of the more daring souls now are venturing near the edge. Yeah, the silhouettes stand out against the metal sheet. One man wants to touch the thing. He's having an argument with the policeman. Now, the policeman wins. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there's something I haven't mentioned in all this excitement, but it's becoming more distinct. Perhaps you've caught it already on your radio. Listen, please. Do you hear it? A curious humming sound that seems to come from inside the object. I'll uh, move the microphone nearer. Here. Now, we're not more than 25 feet away. Uh, can you hear it now? Uh, Professor Pearson? Yes? Uh, can you tell us the meaning of that scraping noise inside the thing? Possibly the unequal cooling of the surface. I say, do you still think it's a meteor, Professor? Metal casing is definitely extraterrestrial. Uh, not found on this earth. Friction with the earth's atmosphere usually tears holes in a meteorite. This thing is smooth and you can see a cylindrical oh, just a minute. shape. Something's happening. Ladies and gentlemen, this is terrific. This end of the thing is beginning to flake off. The top is beginning to rotate like a screw and the thing must be hollow. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the most terrifying thing I, I've ever witnessed. Wait a minute. Someone's calling someone or something. I can see staring out of that black hole through luminous discs. The eyes it might be a face, might be almost a heaven. Something wriggling out of the shadow like a gray snake. Now it's another one and another one and another one. They look like tentacles to me. Oh, yeah, I can see the thing's body now. It's large. It's large as a bear. This one's like wet leather, but it's a face. Ladies and gentlemen, it's indescribable. I can hardly force myself to keep looking at it. It's so awful. The eyes are black and they gleam like a serpent. The mouth is a kind of V shape with saliva it's dripping from its windless lips. It's seen to. Oh, those quivers pulsate and the monster or whatever it is can hardly move. It's 
He's weighed down by uh, possibly gravity or something. The thing's rising up now, and the cloud falls back. It's plenty that it's not very serious, but he's only like, can't find words. And, well, I'll pull this microphone with me as they talk. I'll have to stop the description until I can take a new position. Hold on, will you please? I'll be right back in a minute. bringing you an eyewitness account of what's happening on the Wilmoth Farm, Groversville, New Jersey. We now return you to Carl Phillips at Groversville. Ladies and gentlemen, my aunt. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, here I am, back of a stone wall that joins Mr. Wilmoth's garden. From here, I get a sweep of the whole scene. I'll give you every detail as long as I can talk and as long as I can see. More state police have arrived. They're drawing up a cordon in front of the pit. About 30 of them. No need to push the crowd back now. They're willing to keep their distance. The captain's conferring with someone. Can't quite see who. Oh, yes, I believe it's Professor Pearson. Yes, it is. Now, now they've parted, and the professor moves around one side, studying the object while the captain and two policemen advance with something in their hands. I can see it now. It's a white handkerchief tied to a pole. Flag of truce. Those creatures know what that means, what anything means. Wait a minute, something's happening. Some shape is rising out of the pit. I can make out a small beam of light against a mirror. What's that? There's a jet of flame springing from that mirror and it leaps right at the advancing men. It strikes them head on. The Lord, they're turning into flames. Ah! Oh, the whole field's caught up by the woods of fire. The there's gas tanks, tanks for the automobiles, spreading everywhere. Coming this way now, about 20 yards to my right. Ladies and gentlemen, due to circumstances beyond our control, we are unable to continue the broadcast from Grover's Mill. Evidently, there's some difficulty with our field transmission. However, we will return to that point at the earliest opportunity. In the meantime, we have a late bulletin from San Diego, California. Professor Indelkoffer, speaking at a dinner of the California Astronomical Society, expressed the opinion that the explosions on Mars are undoubtedly nothing more than severe volcanic disturbances on the surface of the planet. We continue now with our piano interview. Ladies and gentlemen, I've just been handed a message that came in from Grover's Mill by telephone. Just one moment, please. At least 40 people, including six state troopers, lie dead in a field east of the village of Grover's Mill. Their bodies burned and distorted beyond all possible recognition. The next voice you hear will be that of Brigadier General Montgomery Smith, commander of the state militia at Trenton, New Jersey. I have been requested by the governor of New Jersey to place the counties of Mercer and Middlesex as, as far west as Princeton and uh, east to Jamesburg under martial law. No one will be permitted to enter this area except by a special pass issued by state or military authorities. Four companies of state militia are proceeding from Trenton to Grover's Mill and uh, will aid in the evacuation of homes within the range of military operations. Thank you. You have just been listening to General Montgomery Smith, commanding the state militia at Trenton. In the meantime, further details of the catastrophe at Grover's Mill are coming in. The strange creatures, after unleashing their deadly assault, crawled back in their pit and made no attempt to prevent the efforts of the firemen to recover the bodies and extinguish the fire. The combined fire departments of Mercer County are fighting the flames which menace the entire countryside. We have been unable to establish any contact with our mobile unit at Grover's Mill but we hope to be able to return you there at the earliest possible moment. In the meantime, we take you to... Just one moment, please. Ladies and gentlemen, I have just been informed that we have finally established communication with an eyewitness of the tragedy. Professor Pearson has been located at a farmhouse near Grover's Mill, where he has established an emergency observation post. As a scientist, he will give you his explanation of the calamity. The next voice you hear will be that of Professor Pearson, brought to you by direct wire. Professor Pearson. One of the creatures in the rocket cylinder at Grover's Mill 
I can give you no authoritative information, either as to their nature, their origin, or their purposes here on Earth. Of their destructive instrument, I might venture some conjectural explanation. For want of a better term, I shall refer to the mysterious weapon as a heat ray. It's all too evident that these creatures have scientific knowledge far in advance of our own. It's my guess that in some way they are able to generate an intense heat in a chamber of practically absolute non-conductivity. This intense heat they project in a parallel beam against any object they choose by means of a polished parabolic mirror of unknown composition. Much as the mirror of a lighthouse projects a beam of light. That, that is my conjecture of the origin of the heat ray. Thank you, Professor Pearson. Ladies and gentlemen, here is the bulletin from Trent. It is a brief statement informing us that the charred body of Carl Phillips has been identified in a Trenton hospital. Now here's another bulletin from Washington, D.C. The office of the director of the National Red Cross reports 10 units of Red Cross emergency workers have been assigned to the headquarters of the state militia, stationed outside of Grover's Mill, New Jersey. Here's a bulletin from State Police, Princeton Junction. The fires at Grover's Mill and vicinity are now under control. Scouts report all quiet in the pit, and there is no sign of life appearing from the mouth of the cylinder. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we have a special statement from Mr. Harry McDonald, Vice President in charge of operations. We have received a request from the state militia of Trenton to place at their disposal our entire broadcasting facility. In view of the gravity of the situation, believing that radio has a responsibility to serve in the public interest at all times, we are turning over our facilities to the state militia of Trenton. Take you now to the field headquarters of the state militia near Grover's Mill, New Jersey. This is Captain Lansing of the Signal Corps attached to the state militia, now engaged in military operations in the vicinity of Grover's Mill. The situation arising from the reported presence of certain individuals of unidentified nature is now under complete control. The cylindrical object lies in a pit directly below our position, surrounded on all sides by eight battalions of infantry without heavy field pieces, but adequately armed with rifles and machine guns. All cause for alarm, if that cause ever existed, is now entirely unjustified. Things, whatever they are, do not even venture to poke their heads above the pit. You see their hiding place plainly in the glare of the searchlight there. With all their reported resources, these creatures can scarcely stand up against heavy machine gun fire. Anyway, it's an interesting outing for the troops. I can make out their cocky uniforms crossing back and forth in front of the lights. It looks almost like a real war. There appears to be some slight smoke in the woods bordering the Millstone River, probably fire started by campers. Well, uh, we ought to see some action soon. One of the companies is deploying on the left flank. A quick thrust and it'll all be over. Now, wait a minute, I see something on top of the cylinder. No, no, it's nothing but a shadow. Now the troops are on the edge of the Wilmot Farm. 7,000 armed men closing in on an old metal tube. A tub, rather. Well, wait, that wasn't a shadow. It's something moving. Solid metal, kind of a steel light there, rising up on the cylinder. Going higher and higher. But it's, it's standing on legs, actually rearing up on a sort of metal framework. Now it's reaching above the trees, and the searchlights are on it. Hold on. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a grave announcement to make. Incredible as it may seem, both the observations of science and the evidence of our eyes lead to the inescapable assumption that those strange beings who landed in the Jersey farmlands tonight are the vanguard of an invading army from the planet Mars. The battle which took place tonight at Grover Mills has ended in one of the most startling defeats ever suffered by an army in modern times. 7,000 men armed with rifles and machine guns pitted against the single fighting machine of the invaders to Mars. 120 known survivors. The rest strewn over the battle area from Grover's Mills to Plainsboro, crushed and trampled to death under the metal feet of the monster, or burned to cinders by a creature. The monster is now in control of the middle section of New Jersey, which has effectively cut the state to its center. Communication lines are down from Pennsylvania to the Atlantic Ocean. Railroad tracks are torn in service from New York to Philadelphia discontinued, except rooting some of the trains through Allison and Phoenixville. Highways to the north, south, and west are clogged with frantic human traffic. Police and army reserves are unable to control the mad flight. By morning, the fugitives will have swelled Philadelphia, Camden, and Trenton 
it is estimated to be twice their normal population. Martial law prevails throughout New Jersey and eastern Pennsylvania. This time we take you to Washington for a special broadcast on the national emergency. The Secretary of the Interior. Citizens of the nation, I shall not try to conceal the gravity of the situation in this front nor the concern of your government in protecting the lives and property of it. However, I wish to impress upon you, private citizens and public officials, all of you, the urgent need of calm and resourceful action. Fortunately, this formidable enemy is still confined to a comparatively small area, and we may place our faith in the military forces to keep them there. In the meantime, placing our faith in God, we must continue the performance of our duty, each and every one of us, so that we may confront this destructive adversary with a nation united, courageous, and consecrated to the preservation of human supremacy on this earth. I thank you. You have just heard the Secretary of the Interior speaking from Washington. Bulletins too numerous to read are piling up in the studio here. We are informed that the central portion of New Jersey is blacked out from radio communication due to the effect of the heat ray upon power lines and electrical equipment. Here is a special bullet from New York. Cables have been received from English, French, and German scientific bodies offering assistance. Astronomers report continued gas outbursts at regular intervals on the planet Mars. The majority voiced the opinion that the enemy will be reinforced by additional rocket machines. There have been several attempts made to locate Professor Pearson at Princeton, who has observed Martians at close range. It is feared he was lost in the recent battle. Langham Field, Virginia. Scouting planes report three Martian machines visible above treetops, moving north toward Somerville with population fleeing ahead of them. The heat ray is not in use, although advancing at train speed, invaders pick their way carefully. They seem to be making a conscious effort to avoid destruction of the city from countryside. However, they stop to uproot power lines, bridges, and railroad tracks. Their apparent objective is to crush resistance, paralyze communication, and disorganize human society. Here is a bulletin from Bastion Ridge, New Jersey. Spoon hunters have stumbled on a second cylinder, similar to the first, embedded in the Great Swamp, 20 miles south of Morristown. Army field pieces are proceeding before the cylinder can be opened and the fighting machine rigged. They are taking up a position in the foothills of Washington Mountain. Another, another, another bulletin from Langham Field, Virginia. Scouting planes report enemy machines now three in number, increasing speed northward, kicking over houses and trees in their evident haste to form a conjunction with their allies south of Marstown. Machines also sighted by telephone operator east of Middlesex within 10 miles of Plainfield. Here's a bulletin from Winston Field, Long Island. A fleet of army bombers carrying heavy explosives flying north in pursuit of enemy. Scouting planes act as guides. They keep the speeding enemy in sight. Just a moment, please, ladies and gentlemen. We've, uh, we've run special wires to the artillery line in adjacent villages to give you direct reports from the zone of the advancing enemy. First, we take you to the battery of the 22nd Field Artillery, located in the Watching Mountains. Range 32 meters. 32 meters. Section 39 degrees. 39 degrees. Fire! <laughs> The rest. Shift range, 31 meters. 31 meters. Section, 37 degrees. 37 degrees. Fire. Yeah. Hit that. I have to run them. Stop. Now they're trying to repair Quick, get the range. Shift, 50, 30 meters. 30 meters. Section, 27 degrees. 27 degrees. Fire. A lantern. Heading off a slope. What is it? This way. Look to the ground. Put on gas map. Ready to fire. 50, 24 meters. 24 meters. Section 24 degrees. 24 degrees. Fire! I can't see, sir. Smoke's coming nearer. Get the range! 
Bombing plane V843 off Bayonne, New Jersey. Lieutenant Boat commanding eight bombers. Reporting to Commander Fairfax Langham Field. This is Boat reporting to Commander Fairfax Langham Field. Enemy tripod machines now in sight. Reinforced by three machines from the Marstown cylinder. Six all together. One machine partially crippled. Believed hit by shell from army gun in Watchung Mountain. Guns now appear silent. A heavy black fog hanging close to the earth of extreme density, nature unknown. No sign of heat ray. Enemy now turns east, crossing Passaic River into the Jersey marshes. Another straddles the Pulaski Skyway. Evident objective is New York City. Pushing down a high tension power station. Teams are close together now and we're ready to attack. Plane circling, ready to strike. A thousand yards and we'll be over the first. Eight hundred yards. Six hundred. Four hundred. 200. There they go. Giant arm raised. Green flash. Spang us with flame. 2,000 feet. Engines are giving out. No chance to release bombs. Only one thing left. Drop on them. Plane and all. We're diving on the first one. The engine's gone! Eight. Bayonne, New Jersey, calling Langham Field. Bayonne, New Jersey, calling Langham Field. Come in, please. Langham Field, go ahead. Eight Army bombers in engagement with enemy tripod machines over Jersey Flat. Engines incapacitated by heat ray. All crashed. One enemy machine destroyed. Enemy now discharging heavy black smoke in direction of... New York, New Jersey. New York, New Jersey. Warning. Poisonous black smoke pouring in from Jersey marshes. South Street. That map's useless. Earth's population move into open spaces. Automobiles use Route 7, 23, 24. Avoid congested areas. Smoke now spreading over, over Raymond Boulevard. To X to L calling six kill to X to L calling six kill to X to L calling eight X three R come in please. Eight X three R coming back at two X two L. As reception. As reception. Hey please. Where are you eight X three R? What's the matter? Where are you? Broadcasting building. I'm speaking from the roof of Broadcasting Building, New York City. The bells to here are ringing to warn the people to evacuate the city as the Martians approach. Estimated in the last two hours, three million people have moved out along the roads to the north. Hutchison River Parkway is still kept open for motor traffic. Boyd bridges to Long Island, hopelessly jammed. All communication with Jersey Shore closed ten minutes ago. No more defenses. Our army is wiped out. Artillery, Air Force, everything wiped out. Maybe the last broadcast. We'll stay here to the end. 
people are holding service here below us in the cathedral. Now I look down the harbor, all, all manner of boats overloaded with fleeing population pulling out from docks. Streets are all jammed. Noise and crowds like New Year's Eve in the city. Wait a minute, the, the enemy is now in sight above the Palisades. Five, five great machines. First one is crossing the river. I can see it from here, waiting, waiting the Hudson like a man waiting through a brook. A bullet in his hand at me. Martian cylinders are falling all over the country. One outside of Buffalo, one in Chicago, St. Louis. Seems to be time and space. Now the first machine reaches the shore. He stands watching, looking over the city. Steel cowlish head is even with his skyscrapers. He waits for the others. Rise like a line of new towers on the city's west side. Now they're lifting their metal hands. This is the end now. Smoke comes out, black smoke drifting over the city. People in the streets see it now. They're running toward the East River, thousands of them, dropping in like rats. Now the smoke's spreading faster. It's reached Times Square. People are trying to run away from it, but it's no use. They, they're falling like flies. Now the smoke's crossing 6th Avenue. 5th Avenue. A uh, hundred yards away. It's, it's 50 feet. CBS presentation of Orson Welles and the Mercury Theatre on the Air in an original dramatization of The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. The performance will continue after a brief intermission. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells, starring Orson Welles and the Mercury Theatre on the Air. these notes on paper. I'm obsessed by the thought that I may be the last living man on earth. I'm hiding in this empty house near Grover's Mill, a small island of daylight cut off by the black smoke of the rest of the world. All that happened before the arrival of these monstrous creatures in the world now seems part of another life. Life that has no continuity with the present furtive existence of the lonely derelict who penciled these words on the back of some astronomical notes bearing the signature of Richard Piss. Looked down at my blackened hand. Try to connect them with a professor who lives at Princeton and who on the night of October 20th glimpsed through his telescope an orange splash of light on a distant planet. My wife, my colleagues, my students, Books. Conservatory. 
My world. Where are they? Did they ever exist? Am I Richard Pierce? What day is it? Two days exist without calendars. There's time passed when there are no human hands left to wipe the box. Writing down my daily life, I tell myself I shall preserve human history between the dark covers of this little book that was meant to record the movement of the stars. Right, I must live, and to live, I must eat. I find moldy bread in the kitchen, an orange, not too spoiled to swallow. Keep watch at the window. Time to time, I catch sight of a Martian above the black smoke. Smoke still holds the house in its black coil, but thanks to hissing sound, and suddenly I see a Martian mounted on his machine, spraying the air with a jet of steam as it dissipates the smoke. I watch in a corner as his huge metal legs nearly brush against the house. Exhausted by terror, I fall asleep. Morning. Sun screams in the window. A black cloud of gas is lifted and the porch meadows in the north look as though a black snowstorm is in. I venture from the house and make my way to a road of traffic. Get in their wrecked car, baggage overturned, the blackened skeleton. Push on north. For some reason I feel safer trailing these monsters than running away. And I keep a careful watch. I've seen the Martians feed. One of their machines appear over the top of trees. I'm ready to fling myself flat on the earth. Come to a chestnut tree. Chestnut to right. Got my pocket. Right. Two days I wander in a vague northerly direction through a desolate world. Finally, I notice a living creature. A small red squirrel in a beech tree. I stare at him and wonder. He stares back at me. I believe at that moment the animal and I shared the same emotion. The joy of finding another living being. Push on north. I find dead cows in a brackish field and beyond the charred ruins of a dairy and silo. I standing guard over the wasteland like a lighthouse. Deserted beds. Stride the silo, purchase a weathercock, the arrow points north. North. Next day, I come to a city. A city vaguely familiar in its contours, yet its buildings strangely dwarfed and leveled off as if a giant had sliced off its highest towers with a capricious sweep of his head. Reached the outskirts of town Newark. Newark. Undemolished, but humbled by some whim of the advancing Martians. Presently, with an odd feeling of being watched, I caught sight of something crouching in a doorway. I made a step towards it. It rose up and became a man. A man armed with a large knife. Stop! I come from... from many places. A long time ago, from Princeton. Princeton. I drove his mill. Yes. I drove his mill. <laughs> There's no food here. This is my country. All this end of town down the river. There's only food for one. Where are you going? I don't know. I guess I'm looking for people. What was that? You hear something just then? No. Only a bird. A live bird. You get to know that birds have shadows these days. Hey, we're in the open here. Let's crawl in this doorway here and fall. Have you seen any Martians? No. They're going over to New York. At night, the sky's alive with their lights. Just as if people were still living. Daylight, you can't see him. 
Five days ago, a couple of them carried something big across the flats from the airport. They think they're learning how to fly. Fly? Yeah, fly. Then it's all over with humanity. Stranger, there's still you and I. Two of us left. They got themselves in solid. They wrecked the greatest country in the world. Those green stars, they're probably falling somewhere every night. They've only lost one machine. There isn't anything to do. We're done. We're licked. Where were you? You're in a uniform. Yeah, what's that? I was in the militia. National Guard. <laughs> That's good. There wasn't any war. Any more than there's war between men and ants. Yes, but we're eatable ants. I found that out. What will they do to us? I thought it all out. Right now, we're caught as we're wanted. The Martian only has to go a few miles to get a crowd on the run. If they won't keep on doing that, they'll begin catching us systematically, like keeping the best and storing us in cages and things. They haven't begun on us yet. Begun? Not begun. All that's happened so far is because we don't have sense enough to keep quiet, bothering them with guns and such stuff and losing our heads and rushing off in crowds. Uh, instead of our rushing around blind, we got to fix ourselves up, fix ourselves up according to the way things are now. Cities, nations, civilization, progress. Yes, but if that's so, what is there to live for? Well, there won't be any more concerts for a million years or so, and no nice little dinners at restaurants. If it's amusement you're after, I guess the game's up. What is there left? Life, that's what. I want to live. Yeah, and so do you. We're not going to be exterminated. I don't mean to be caught either. Tamed and fattened and bred like an ox. What's going on? right under their feet. I got a plan. We men as men finish. We don't know enough. We got to learn plenty before we got a chance. We've got to live and keep free while we learn, see? I thought it all out, see? It's under the wrist. Well, it isn't all of it. It's the wild beast. That's what it got to be. It's got to be. Wild West. Watch the All those little office workers who used to live in these houses, they be no good. They haven't any stuff in them. Run. Run off to work. I've seen hundreds of them running to catch their commuters train in the morning. Afraid they could can if they didn't. Run them back at night. Afraid they wouldn't be in time for dinner. Lives and sure, and a little invested in case of action. They're on Sunday. Worried about the hereafter. Martians, they'll be a god to those guys. Nice, roomy cages. Good food, careful breeding, no worries. Yeah, after a week or so of chasing around the fields on empty stomachs, they'll come and be glad to be caught. You've thought it all out, haven't you? Sure. Bet I. That isn't all. These Martians are going to make pets of Train them to do tricks. Who knows? Get sentimental over the pet boy who grew up and had to be killed. Yeah. Some maybe. They'll train to hunt us. Yes, they will. There's men who do it flat. Time. You and I and others like us. Where are we to live when the Martians own the earth? All to live. They live underground. They think about the sewers. And in New York, they're miles and miles up. The main ones are big enough for anybody. And there's some vaults, underground storerooms, railway tunnels, subways. Get a bunch of strong men together. No weak. That rubbish, out. As you meant me to. You a chance. Won't quarrel about that. Go on. You gotta make safe places for us to stay in. Get all the books we can. Science books. That's where men like you come in, see? We raid the museums. We'll even spy on the marsh. May not be so much we have to learn before. Imagine this. Four or five of their own fighting machines suddenly start off. Heat rays right and left. Not a Martian in them. Not a Martian in them, see? But men. Men who've learned the way how. They even in our time. Gee. Imagine having one of them lovely things with a heat ray wide and free. We turn it on Martians. We turn it on men. 
We bring everybody down on their knees. That's your plan. Yeah. You, you. You don't know the world. I see. Yeah. Not to your world. Bye, stranger. The last parting with the artilleryman I came at last to the Holland Tunnel and his that silent tube. Anxious to know the fate of the great city on the other side of the Hudson. Cautiously, I came out of the tunnel and made my way up Canal Street. Reached 14th Street there again with black powder and several bodies and an evil, ominous smell from the gratings of the cellars of some of the houses. I wandered up through the 30s and 40s. Stood alone on Times Square. Caught sight of a lean dog running down 7th Avenue with a piece of dark brown meat in his jaw. Packed a starving mongrel. He made a wide circle around me as though he feared I might prove a fresh competitor. Walked up Broadway in the direction of that strange powder, that silent shop windows, playing their mute wares to empty sidewalks. Past the Capitol Theater, silent. Dark. Past a shooting gallery where a row of empty guns faced a rested line of wood ducks near Columbus Circle. I noticed models of 1939 motor cars in the showrooms facing empty streets. Over the top of the General Motors building, I watched a flock of black birds circling in the sky. Hurried on. Suddenly, I caught sight of the hood of a Martian machine standing somewhere in Central Park, gleaming in the late afternoon sun. Same idea. I, I, I rushed recklessly across Columbus Circle and into the park. I, I climbed a small hill above the pond at 60th Street. From there, I could see standing in a silent row along the mall, 19 of those great metal titans, their cowls empty, their steel arms hanging listlessly by their sides. I looked in vain for the monsters that inhabit those machines. Suddenly, my eyes were attracted to the immense flock of black birds that hovered directly below me. They circled to the ground. And there before my eyes, dark and silent, lay the Martians with the hungry birds pecking and tearing brown shreds of flesh and dead bodies. Later, when their bodies were examined in laboratories, it was found that they were killed by the putrefactive and disease bacteria against which their systems were unprepared. Plain, after all, man's adventure to fail. For the humblest thing that God has wisdom has put upon this earth. Before the cylinder fell, there was general persuasion that through all the deep space, no life existed beyond the petty surface of our minute sphere. Now we see further, dim and wonderful is the vision I've conjured up in my mind of life spreading slowly from this little seedbed of the solar system throughout the inanimate vastnesses of sidereal space. A remote dream. Maybe that the destruction of the Martians is only a reprieve to them and not to us. Future are dangerous. Ah, strange it now seems to sit in my peaceful study, Princeton, writing down this last chapter of the record. Begun at the deserted farm of Rosenstein. Strange to watch children playing at his feet. Strange to see young people strolling on the green where the new spring grass heals the last black scars of a brewster. Strange to watch the sightseers Enter the museum where the dissembled parts of a Martian machine are kept on public view. Strange when I recall the time when I first saw it. Bright, clean cut, hard, silent, under the dawn of that last great day. Orson Welles, ladies and gentlemen.
out of character to assure you that the war of the world has no further significance than as the holiday offering it was intended to be. The Mercury Theater's own radio version of dressing up in a sheet and jumping out of a bush and saying boo. Starting now, we couldn't soak all your windows and seal all your garden gates by tomorrow night, so we did the best next thing. We annihilated the world before your very ears and utterly destroyed the CBS. We'll be relieved, I hope, to learn that we didn't mean it and that both institutions are still open for business. So goodbye, everybody, and remember, please, for the next day or so, the terrible lesson you learned tonight. That grinning, glowing, globular invader of your living room is an inhabitant of the pumpkin patch, and if your doorbell rings and nobody's there, that was no Martian, it's Halloween. Broadcasting. <laughs>